the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al Anbiya wal Mursaleen wa ala Alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Thumma amma ba'd fa a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Tilka ayatu al-kitab al-mubim. Natlu alayka min nabai Musa wa fir'awna bil-haq li qawmi yu'minun. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yassir li amri. Wahlul uqtatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. So in these few minutes that I have with you, I originally thought I have 30 minutes, but now I've been told I have 15, which is better for me. Um, so in these few minutes that I do have with you to share, um, I'm supposed to be talking to you about Musa alayhi salam, Moses. Uh, yeah, it's too loud, isn't it? You can't hear anything? Oh, no. <laughs> now you can hear? You still can't hear? Stop talking to each other then. It's okay. You want, I can use that, yeah, sure. I'm going to use this, okay? okay? Is this better? This isn't better either. Then you can't be helped. Mic person? Is this, is this all we're going to do? Just go on? Okay. Guys, just try to... Yeah. Da. Oh, this one's down. Yeah. Okay, I'll just try to speak and inshallah ta'ala they'll fix the mic eventually and it'll work. Okay? Alright, so I, I'm supposed to be talking to Musa. Uh, Moses in the Quran, I will use the word Musa, I'm not going to use the word Moses because we are talking about the Quran That's the Arabic rendition of the word um, And the first thing I want to share with you, if you don't already know, he is the most mentioned figure in the Quran There are over 70 passages dedicated, dispersed throughout the Quran that just specifically talk about Musa And he is essentially a role model from many, many, many points of view When you think of the career of Musa alayhi salam May peace, be, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him You think of his major accomplishments In other words, you know, the savior of the children of Israel Crossing of the water The adventures that, that ensued thereafter A lot of our friends from the people of the book The Christians and the Jewish communities You know, they're familiar obviously with these stories as well But the Quran presents this You have to understand first and foremost When the Quran presented this narrative It was presenting it to an audience by and large That wasn't Christian or Jewish and had no background in who this man is So it's as though the Qur'an was introducing Musa to them the Qur'an was introducing Moses to them And it wasn't citing previous scripture to introduce this man to them It was just giving his account on its own On its own merits And the, the other thing that's important to note When somebody becomes after this talk Perhaps you're curious and you go pick up a copy of the Qur'an And you want to look up Moses in the Qur'an You'll find him all over the place and So the question will arise, why not just have a chapter called Moses Surat Musa And just put it all in one place It's not going to be the case in the Qur'an Nor is the account of Musa in the Qur'an going to be chronological As much as he's mentioned, his account is not chronological So what's the, what's the method? What's the perspective? What's the agenda behind mentioning, the Quran, the mentioning of Moses in such a dispersed fashion in the Qur'an? The Qur'an is made up of 114 surahs and it's as though every surah is a thesis Every surah has an, a central lesson to teach And there are parts In every surah, or many surahs actually, you'll find stories But only the part of that, that, that part of the story will be mentioned That goes towards furnishing that thesis So the Qur'an is not interested in citing history for its own sake History for its own sake is not the purpose It is to draw lessons from history for, for the guidance of humanity for spiritual guidance, for upliftment, for understanding, for wisdom That's the purpose of the citation of the story So you'll find if in one area, one, one, one surah The subject matter is the conflict between good and evil 
And it may seem like the forces of evil are much more powerful, much more resourceful, they have much more political power, financial strength, etc., etc., and those standing by truth have very little, then maybe just the battle, the clash between Moses and the Pharaoh, Musa and the Pharaoh, and the dialogue he's having inside the castle, inside the, you know, before the throne of the Pharaoh, that conversation is cited. Why? Because it resonates with those struggling for the truth against a powerful opposition. So that's how the, the stories are essentially laid out. But none of this does justice to how Musa is talked about in the Qur'an. And really when I was, when I was first given this topic by email, like you're, you're going to have 30 minutes originally, for talking about Musa in the Qur'an, I said, oh my God, who did this to me? Because really, if you, you, you can't possibly talk about Musa and the way he's talked about in the Qur'an at all in such a short fashion. I can tell you some things about it, but we're never going to do justice to it. So what I've decided to do is take a small sampling from the Qur'an itself of how Musa has talked about it, how he's brought about in a particular surah and share some things with you from that. I mean, there are so many aspects to his career that are talked about in different surahs, but I'll highlight a few things. So, Surah Al-Qasas, the 28th surah, Tilka Ayatul Kitab al mubin These are the miraculous signs of the clear and clarifying book. This book in and of itself is clear and it seeks to clarify ambiguity, to remove mystery. نَتْلُوا عَلَيْكَ مِن نَبَأِ مُوسَى وَفِرْعَوْنَ بِالْحَقِّ I didn't do that. Okay. We're, we're reading on to you from the events of Musa, the news of Moses. We're going to tell you some of his accounts. The word min in the Arabic language suggests we won't tell you the whole thing. In this surah, we'll tell you some part of it. I already suggested to you before, there's the, the citation of historical accounts in the Qur'an is partial. So a part is going to be mentioned. And then Allah adds himself. Oh. Can you stop doing that? So you were doing that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Can I go on now? I'm scared. Okay. Hold on, I'm going to turn this off first. Oh my god. <laughs> Seriously guys, this is a really bad practical joke. Okay. Okay. So what was I talking about? Something about Islam or something? So. Oh yeah. Surah, surah what? Muslims? Surah Al-Qasas. Very good. Okay. نَتْلُوا عَلَيْكَ مِن نَبَأِ مُوسَى وَفِرْعَوْنَ بِالْحَقِّ we're reading on to you from the account of Musa and Fir'aun with purpose. Bilhaq also means truthfully, meaning this is a true account, but haq also in Arabic implies purpose, reason. Like Allah says, Khalaqa samawati wal arda bilhaq. He created the skies and the earth with truth, meaning with purpose. There's a reason for which creation exists. You know? So in other words, Allah is telling us whenever He tells the story of Musa, and especially in this case, there's a reason for which He will tell us everything He will tell us. He's already mentally preparing His audience. لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ Then he adds another thing. So first it has a purpose. But the purpose will only be found by a certain group of people. Not everybody who will read the Qur'an will get the same result. So Allah qualifies. You know how sometimes you take a course and there is a prerequisite tab that tells you, well here's the people, here are the people that should take this course. And here's what they should hope to get out of it. Right? Similarly, <coughs> Ouch. Okay, awesome. So similarly when uh, uh, I, I used to teach a course in college and before I would uh, start my course, I'd hand out this small survey, why are you taking this course? I b b brought you to me and somebody would say my parents, others would say things like it's a requirement for my major, others would say I'm in interested in the subject, others would say I have no idea, I think I'm in the wrong room, but people wrote, wrote different kinds of reasons. Well see, that's the same thing with studying anything, people come to it for different reasons. So people, even the Qur'an, people will come to the Qur'an for different reasons. But Allah says in this surah, in the beginning already, when I tell you this story, you will not find purpose in it unless you belong to the following group of people, the group of people that approach this surah with this intention. Now what is that intention? لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ For a nation that seeks to believe. Those of you who are a little bit familiar with the Arabic language, Allah did not say لِقَوْمٍ مُؤْمِنِينَ The Arabic word mu'minin is not used. That would be an adjective. This is, you know... Uh, majroor, or fi mahal jar, fi al mudarif fi mahal jar. 
it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a verb acting as an adjective. What that means in English simply is a nation that actually wants to believe, that is seeking faith. They're genuinely looking for faith, and then they come to this narrative, they'll find something. Now the one who's not looking, maybe somebody is coming to the text just to find something to criticize. Guess what? They're going to find plenty to criticize. Because they came with that perspective. Somebody's coming to the text just out of curiosity. Well, they're going to satiate their curiosity. They're going to find some interesting things. You know, somebody comes to the text with anger. They'll find reasons to be angrier. It is what it is. There's a certain bias we bring to a text. And Allah says, the bias that I want you to have, because it's always going to be there, is the bias that I'm seeking faith. I'm looking for a reason to believe. I'm seeking out truth. لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ now, eventually, or in the beginning already, Allah says, نَطْلُوا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ نَبَأِ مُوسَى وَفِرْعَوْنَ We're narrating on to you the story of Musa and Fir'aun. Fir'aun is the Arabic word for the Pharaoh. So already, even in the title of the story, we've been told he's not the only important character. Just make use of your time. Okay. So I said before, uh, uh, Allah says, إِنَّ مُوسَى وَفِرْعَوْنَ عَلَى فِي الْأَرْضِ Moses and the Pharaoh, they both. By the way, I just added 10 minutes to my time because of that. Schedule keeper. Yep, I did. Totally. Okay, so. <laughs> Musa and Fir'aun, they, you know, uh, this, is, this is the story of Musa and Fir'aun alayhi salam. Or alayhi salam wa la'anahu Allah. Why? Because both have something to teach. The account of one we have to learn a lot from. And Fir'aun we have to learn a lot from too. What I love about Surah Qasas and the story of Musa, specifically in this surah, is that Allah builds the scenery around Musa alayhi salam and eventually gets to Musa alayhi salam. We don't start going into the main character in the story from the very beginning. Everything around him, all the things that are happening around him and all these, if you want to talk about it from a, from a movie perspective, the sub-characters, these other characters, they're being, we're learning something about them. And because we are now familiar with modern film, at least some of you are, many of you are too religious, you've never seen a movie before, but like those of you that are, you understand that sometimes in a movie, they open up with the final scene. You ever see that? They start the movie with the final scene. And, you know, and it's all coming to an end. And then they, they, they say three weeks earlier. And you know, they cut out of that scene, and three weeks, everything's calm, it's a breezy day, and you're like... How are they going to get from this nice day to that crazy scene I just saw that's supposed to happen at the end of the movie, you understand? Well, this is a modern film device, or, or, or literary device even, to, to, you know, to pique curiosity. Because the entire time, the, the listener to the story, the viewer of the film, the reader of the book is wondering, how are we going to get there? How is that going to end up happening? You know? So what does Allah do in this surah? Allah Azza wa Jal in the beginning passage already tells us that Fir'aun and Haman his chief architect, they're both going to be learning a very serious lesson. Inna Fir'auna ala fil ard. And actually, in this short talk, I didn't even want to talk to you about Musa. I wanted to talk to you about how everything that surrounds Musa in the Quran is also full of so much detail and has so much to offer. Specifically, in this case, the Pharaoh himself. Inna Fir'auna ala fil ard. In fact, it was the Pharaoh who elevated himself or who was high in the land. Ala fil ard. Ala, very interesting verb in the Arabic language. It, one of the meanings of Allah is to be high yourself, meaning to have high status, to have a high position of political power, of economic power, social status, etc. This is Allah. But also, it means to transgress or to rebel. Have you ever heard the English axiom, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely? You've heard that before, right? The idea of the Arabic language is when you get high, there's a tendency to become corrupt. There's a tendency. So Allah mentions that he was very high in the land. And in this particular ayah, those of you that are ever going to study political science, this is an ayah in and of itself that's a thesis. How did he maintain his elevation in the land? عَلَى فِي الْأَرْضِ وَجَعَلَ أَهْلَهَا شِيَعًا Formula number one. And he had made its people, the people of the land, Egypt obviously we're talking about, Misr. He had made the people of the land into factions, Shia'an. Sha'a in Arabic means to branch out, meaning a branch is extended from the, the stem of a tree, so it's kind of separate from it, but it's still somehow connected. It's still somehow connected. And it's feeding off of the original tree. And eventually, if there's a load enough on that branch, it can actually even harm the tree itself, right? So one of the words in Arabic for factions is Shia. 
That's the word used here. He took his population and made them into factions. The easiest, simplistic understanding of that is that obviously they were the locals. And then he took the Israelites and made them into a slave or a second class. So he broke them up into two factions. But it goes even deeper that he made sure that even a large population like the Israelites remain factions among themselves. That they don't see themselves as part of one unity. They see themselves as separated. Shia in Arabic also means, of the many words in the Qur'an used for groups, is a group aligned by an agenda. When you see yourself, you want to feel safe, you want to be around people who think like you, and you will follow them, you're basically going to have group think. You're going to become a gang, a faction. That's what he wanted. He wanted people to be broken up into gangs and factions. So they couldn't have collective strength. They're too busy keeping their own gang, their own faction together, and calling to it. You know, And this is actually a very powerful phenomenon in keeping a people abased in any land. When you have oppressors that do what they want to do with the people, the easiest way for them to do that is to not let the people see themselves as one. They have to see themselves as this ethnicity, that ethnicity, this school of thought, that school of thought, this congregation, that congregation. They have to separate themselves and draw a line around themselves and say, I belong here, and those guys belong over there. And let me tell you why those guys are wrong. So all of their energies are exhausted either validating themselves or invalidating the other. Just reinforcing the lines that have been drawn on them. You know? None of their energies are exhausted on making the, the, the state of affairs for the people better. They can't think bigger than that. You know? I'll give you a parallel to help you understand this. That I give to you know, younger students. When a person is selfish, they only think about themselves, yes? But when a person is raised with a good upbringing in their family, they're not just concerned about themselves, they also worry about their family. You worry about your parents, you worry about your children, you worry about your siblings, you want good for them too. And if in a real upbringing, you don't just care about your family, you'll be kind to your neighbor too. You'll be concerned about your neighborhood also. You'll be concerned about your community also. That ripple effect just carries out. It starts with care for the family and it ripples out. That's what happens in a decent upbringing. As opposed to that, an indecent upbringing, the only one you'll ever care about is who? Yourself. Everything else is secondary. Everything else can be sacrificed. Everyone else is secondary. You're looking out for number one and that's the end of it. Now what happens in a, in a faction? People join a faction not for the group, but for themselves. They don't go into it to serve, they, won't, they go into it to be served. Somehow it helps their self-esteem, it gives them an opportunity to look down on others, or whatever it may be. But they join that faction for some self-serving purpose. So it's an extension of selfishness. And when that's at the root of a faction, it'll never be able to produce good for anyone else. Because at the end of it, even those people within it, they're all looking for something for their own selves. They're not looking to give, they're only looking to take. Allah describes this state of affairs for lots of factions and says, تَعْرِفُهُمْ جَمِيعًا وَقُلُوبُهُمْ شَتَّى You'll see they're all united. You'll, they'll appeal to you as they're all united and their hearts are all over the place. They're everywhere, you know. So, so Fir'aun first reinforced this idea of factions. Somehow he was able to do this among his people. What was the net result? وَيَسْتَضْعِفُ طَائِفَةً مِّنْهُمْ he would maintain one group to be weak. He would weaken one group among them. A large population among them. So there's a shift, you know, from Shia to Ta'ifa in the Arabic language. Ta'ifa is a large population also, large group also. Okay? In other words, they think of themselves as individualized groups. But when it comes to oppressing them, they're all just one big Ta'ifa to him. This is one big group to him. You know, there may be... I'll give you an example. In, in, in New York is an interesting place. I lived most of my adult life in New York. So you'll have like the, unfortunately, the Bangladeshi masjid, and you'll have the, the Pakistani masjid, and you have the Egyptian masjid. And you guys know what I'm talking about, that's why you're smiling. Okay? I'm from the Bangladeshi masjid, I'm from the Pakistani masjid. Yeah, I know. Okay? So you, and you're in these groups, and you, you totally see yourselves as completely different from those guys. But the guy who hates Islam and hates Muslims sees all y'all bunch as one. <laughs> He hates you all just the same. He sees you as one. And all of you have been made weak. And one of the causes of that weakness is that inner friction. Is that just that inner friction, you know? يَسْتَضْعِفُ طَائِفَةً مِّنْهُمْ He was weakening a group among them. Then, now that they're weak, they can't even defend themselves. They can't, they can't think bigger than their own little mini-identity. 
So they can't defend themselves. They can't stand. And so what comes next? Yudabihu abna'ahum wa yastahi nisa'ahum. He would slaughter their children and let their women live. Yes, I know. According to my new timeline, right? That's yes, according to my new timeline. Yeah. He would slaughter their children and let their women live. In other words, this was his formula. Start by changing the way people think about themselves and think about others. And that way they'll become isolated. And when they're isolated, they will re remain weak. And when they are weak, no matter what you do with them, they will say, we're weak, what can we do? We're just stuck in this situation, we're powerless. What a formula. This, this, these are the makings of an amazing tyrant. And you will find tyranny wherever you find this kind of tyranny in the world, you'll find this formula applied. You'll find, if you find a people that are abased and weakened, you'll find this among them, infighting among them. You'll find, uh, you know, and those infightings being reinforced by a larger power. And then eventually their, their civil rights are taken, then their human rights are taken, their, you know, their, their liberties are taken, and even lives are taken eventually and nobody cares. You know, it just goes, gets swept under just like a news item in the news. It's a little, little footnote on the news. This many people died in this country or whatever. It doesn't matter anymore. You know, this is, the, this is the makings of tyranny. In other words, when we learn about Musa, and when we learn about all the people around Musa, we're not just learning a story. We're learning about these archetypes that represent problems in society and solutions for them. Now what does Allah say in this incredible story? إِنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُفْسِدِينَ He no doubt was among those who caused corruption. This is beautiful, huh? Allah didn't say إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاسِدًا or مُفْسِدًا He was a cause of corruption. No, no doubt he was among those who caused corruption because throughout history you'll find other pharaohs. He's just one among them. He's just one of a, of a, a large bunch of people that can be bunched together. They're a category. Now this sounds pretty depressing from the very beginning. So what does Allah say? We intended that we would bestow our favor upon those who were made weak in the land. And we would give them, we would make them the leaders with direction. We would make the weak the leaders of the earth. And we would make them inherit. We will make them the ones that inherit. You know the, the biblical phrase, the meek shall inherit the earth. Quran finds it too. Especially the, the case study in the Qur'an of that, the meek inheriting the earth, is the Israelites. It's a very powerful case study of that phenomenon. I'm going to skip a little bit, but actually no, I won't skip, I changed my mind. The Qur'an's wording is incredible. Allah says, and we will station them in the land, we will give them settlement in the land, the Israelites. We will make them a, a firm nation that is state, well put in the land, situated in the land. They're not going to be Bedouins and Nobats traveling all over the place. We're going to give them power in the land. And we will finally show Fir'aun, the Pharaoh, and Haman, and their armies. Minhum, their armies among them, Makanu Yahdarun. What they were cautious of. Al Hidr in Arabic, it's something to do with fear. But Allah didn't say, Makanu Yahafun. Meaning they were, up to, they were up to all these strategies and policies in place they put in place to make sure these people remain weak because they were afraid of a people rising. They were afraid of that. And so Allah says they were so cautious and took, took precaution and wanted to make sure this never happens. And Allah says we were going to not only give them station in the land, within the lifetime of Pharaoh he would see the very thing he took so many precautions against. He would see all of his precautions blow up in his face. That's what he would see. Meaning all of those precautions are on the one hand, and then God's plan, Allah's plan is on the other hand. And the oppressor will find his end. He will find his end eventually. And now as this final, this is the end of Pharaoh's legacy. That's what's mentioned in the beginning of this surah. Here's what I'll leave you with. Here's what Allah Azza wa does. That now movie producers cop copy. وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضِعِيهِ we reveal to the mother of Musa, breastfeed him. What? We were just learning about the Pharaoh. I know. One minute, I know. We were just learning about the Pharaoh. And that his entire empire is going to crumble. And the people are going to rise from weakness. And the next thing, mother, feed your child. It's a complete switch. You know what it should say underneath? A few years ago, and it switches over, and there's a mom in a room, and her baby's crying, and something comes into her heart from Allah Himself, 
Feed your child. Now the question arises, why even mention feed your child? You know why? Because eventually when he go goes to the Pharaoh's castle and you know how he ends up there, when he goes there, he's going to have a little bit of an appetite. And he's going to say, I want milk. And he's going to turn all the other milk down except the one that the mother was inspired to give him and he's got a taste for it and he won't taste anything else. It's part of the plan. So something as small as the mother feeding the child becomes part of the divine plan in bringing the tyrant ruler down. Every detail is important. An ardi'ihi wa fa'idha khifti alayhi. So she's feeding her poor baby and she hears the commotion of the soldiers coming, looking for the baby boys. When you fear upon him, fa'alqihi fil yammi. Then throw him in the water, throw him in the river. Yam literally means that which flows downstream. Okay, a river that flows downstream is yam. It's considered a larger body of water by comparison. Don't fear and don't grieve. Two words. And I'll end with this. I know my, th my minute is pretty much up. I'll try and respect that, inshallah. I'm not going to be that guy. You know that guy? And in conclusion, 20 minutes later, and finally, and I leave you with. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to stick to it, inshallah. So in conclusion, don't fear and don't grieve, he tells his mother. You know, we learn that fear is something you have of the future. I'm afraid of losing my job. I'm afraid of getting stuck in traffic. I'm afraid for my parents' health or for my children's safety, etc. Stuff that hasn't happened yet, you are afraid. Bad stuff that's already happened, bad, is, I think that's a sign of telling me time's up, but anyway. Bad stuff that's already happened, you, you feel what? Fear or grief? Grief. The mother's told, don't fear and don't grieve. Why? As she's about to put him in the water, there is fear. When the child is gone from her eyes, what settles in? Grief. And he protects her from both sides. And this is an amazing statement to the mother. And this is not something, if any human being was to tell any, other, any mother that can't find her child, may Allah protect our children. It's a crowded convention, keep an eye on your kids. If your kids are anything like my kids, then they are psychotic. They will disappear before you within five seconds. So keep an eye on your children. But when you cannot find your children, just look around, you don't see your child, what happens to you? You lose your mind. The fear, the grief, these emotions just like overwhelm you. You can't think straight for those few seconds. And then you find he's turning around with you just to keep, keep you going, right? But those two things, no human being can calm a mother down when she feels those things. No human being can do it. But Allah can. Because Allah put that in her heart. Allah put that calm in her heart. You know? So, and I, I, we could go just on and on and on about these ayat. But I wanted to share with you how picturesque and how in-depth the narrative of Musa is. Every word has something to offer. There's some detail about the story. And if you've read the story already in Surah Taha, when you come to Surah Al-Qasas, the camera angles are all different. Allah is just looking at it from a completely different point of view. He's telling us something. You're like, hey, I already read this. But no, I didn't know that. Oh, wow, that happened too? That happened there too? And they even copy that in film now. You know what they do? They'll tell you this, you know, they got, you got to this final scene. They'll show you how one character ended up there. Then they'll show you the entire narrative of how the other character ended up there too. From another, angle's point, from another angle, you know. The Qur'an does that. It keeps building curiosity into the same account. It's a very beautiful narrative and it's a very powerful narrative and it's an extremely celebrated narrative. Well, I, the last... Should I, should I do this? Okay. Last, last, last bit. <laughs> to the Muslims here. To the Muslims here. Bani Israel, the children of Israel are an honored people in the Qur'an. Most prophets mentioned in the Qur'an are the sons of Israel. The word Israel itself is an honored word in the Qur'an. It actually means the slave of Allah. I'm sharing these things with you because if you really are believers in the Qur'an, we don't have hatred for a people for what their lineage is. That's not from Islam. That's not a part of Islam. We don't have that. We, have, we, we abhor certain attitudes, certain behaviors. We cannot hate people. We cannot hate people. The Prophet didn't hate people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, he, he, was, he was kind and merciful to all nations. So we have to remove these things. And if you counter-argue with me, well, they hate us. Well, let them. We're Muslim. We're not reactionaries. We're not reactionaries. Then you're just like them if you do that, if you respond in kind. But it should never, these kinds of attitudes should never come from us. 
towards people of any nation, especially not, even, not, not Bani Israel. Don't allow the world around you and what's happening around you to skew what you and I should be taking from the book of Allah because that's timeless guidance. May Allah Azza wa Jal help us appreciate the beauty and the power of His final revelation. And may Allah Azza wa Jal help us make it easy for the rest of this country and the rest of this world to understand what an amazing message it is that we have in our midst. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.